Let us pray. O oh God, by your, your Holy Spirit, tell us what we need to hear and show us what we ought to do to obey Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. The first reading this morning comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 56, verses 1 through 8. Thus says the Lord, maintain justice and do what is right, for soon my salvation will come and my deliverance be revealed. Happy is the mortal who does this, the one who holds it fast, who keeps it the Sabbath, not profaning it, and refrains from doing any evil. Do not let the foreigner join to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. And do not let the eunuch say, I am just a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, who cho choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than the sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it, and hold fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accented on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Thus says the Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, I will gather others to them beside those already gathered. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is taken from uh, Galatians, the Epistle Galatians, chapter 3, verses 23 to 29. It is speaking words that echo what Bill just read from Isaiah. Now, before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian, for in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In 1926, the Presbyterian Church in the United States of America, General Assembly, debated whether people using tobacco could be ordained to the gospel ministry. Now, while many of us may find tobacco use a little distasteful, I don't know if anyone here, and correct me if I'm wrong, would want to bar someone from serving as a ruling elder or a deacon in other congregations or a minister of word and sacrament simply because they might smoke a cigarette or a pipe or a cigar now and then. How to decide who is in and who is out as leaders of the faithful 
or as members of a branch of the church has been contentious since there have been churches and actually before that, before there were any churches. Whether and how to draw the circle wider was the question they were facing. This Sunday is the third in a three-part series, so if it's not your cup of tea, this is the final one, uh, of, along the theme of Presby 101, um, while focusing on Bible passages, of course, each Sunday I have been exploring different aspects of our Presbyterian heritage. I heard from several people, as some of you know, back in January when I was polling people about what to do for the soup and study for Lent, uh, a bunch of people said, I'd like to learn more about Presbyterianism. So this is my nod in that direction. I will come back to how the Presbyterian Church USA, the PC USA, this denomination of which South Plains is a member, is drawing the circle wider. But uh, I'll do that in a few minutes. But it's worth noting that these questions, of course, are not reserved only for the church. As I mentioned last week and probably in the week before that, there are parallels between the way a church, especially Presbyterians, organize ourselves and the United States government. And we explored a little bit of why that was last Sunday. So the writers of the United States Constitution, as we very well know, had a very narrow understanding and definition of men when they wrote all men are created equal. At that time, the only people given the right to vote, it wasn't just about gender, it was land owning white men. Only 6% of the population was eligible to vote in that first presidential election. Now you likely know that the 15th amendment states that the vote cannot be denied because of race. After it passed in 1870, for decades and decades, other tactics were used since that uh, pointing to the Constitution was no longer possible. Other tactics were used to prevent African Americans from voting, and we know this. And 153 years later, one can make a good case that there are still barriers for them and other people of color. So it took almost 70 years of protests until in 1920, women received the right to vote. 70 years of protests. It wasn't until 1947, 1947, that legal barriers to Native Americans, indigenous peoples, voting, uh, their ability to vote, that those barriers were removed. They were here in the first place. And in 1952, people from, who were immigrating from Asian countries finally got the, wrote, the right to become citizens and therefore to vote, 1952. The circle takes a long time to be drawn wider. As I've said in these past few Sundays, we don't always live up to the lofty language of our ideals, whether those ideals are of a nation, of the church, or even in our family relationships. Sometimes the Holy Spirit and the prophetic voices of people in our midst need to pull us kicking and screaming into a more expansive view of humanity and of God's love. About a hundred years ago, Scottish writer G.K. Chesterton, in a book entitled, get this, What's Wrong with the World, uh, G.K. Chesterton wrote in that book, and it's sometimes wrongly attributed to C.S. Lewis, but Chesterton wrote this. The Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. Drawing the circle wider is part of that difficult, difficult calling. When we look to the scriptures for guidance, it is shaped, of course, by the worldview of those who set it down 
uh, first in oral tradition and then in writing. Our own innate tribalism can find plenty of backing in the Bible, to be sure. But there are also many passages in scripture that talk about God's love of the outcast and the call for all God's followers to do the same, to love the outcast, those whom society wants to push away. That reading that Bill shared from Isaiah talks about God's covenant, and of course it does speak about keeping the Sabbath, but it, it talks about God's covenant extending well beyond sort of the people that were automatically assumed to be pure and holy and clean. The eunuchs will receive from God, not just, oh, okay, you can come in the side entrance, but a monument in God's house and an everlasting name. Foreigners will be brought to God's holy mountain. And this is uh, that famous verse, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. In those short verses from Galatians, we find a lofty Bible passage worth embroidering on a sampler, and literally I wrote this before the whole habitat sampler thing, <laughs> but it is worth embroidering onto a sampler and hanging on the wall as a reminder. Uh, that verse 28, there is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. That is a verse for the ages that draws the circle very wide. I have talked before about how the early church and Paul struggled to define who Christians are. They didn't even call Christians Christians. It was people of the way. The first followers of Jesus were, of course, Jews. But Paul heard God's call to share the good news with the broader ancient world. Non-Jews were Greeks or Gentiles because they weren't always Greek in ethnicity. Theologian Mark Douglas says this about Galatians 3. How much like a Jew does a gentle need to be, Gentile need to be in order to be a Christian? This is an odd question to modern ears, but in the middle of the first, first century, this was perhaps the most important moral question the church faced. Sex and money and all the other concerns that dominate modern society's moral life were secondary." End quote. This is an important theological question, he writes, because on the one hand, God made promises to Abraham and to Abraham's heirs, but Gentiles are not natural heirs of Abraham. On the other hand, God's promises apply to Jews. If God's promises apply to Jews, why do they need the crucified Jesus? Paul doesn't want to portray God either as a promise breaker nor does he want the crucified Jesus to be irrelevant to Jews. In first century Palestine, the question is, how can the circle be drawn wider without abandoning the covenant between God and the Jews? His theological answer is twofold. First, the law trained and disciplined the people until the coming of Christ. Now that Christ has come, all who belong to Christ are Abraham's offspring and heirs to the promise. That language is in Galatians. We have all been adopted. The Jews whose heritage gave the law were disciplined by it. The Gentiles who did not know the law are now adopted into the covenant through Jesus.
In the Presbyterian Church USA, we have struggled for generations over where the circle is drawn for church membership, for ordination to deacon, elder, or minister of word and sacrament. I began with that reference from a book by Jack Rogers about the 1926 controversy about whether tobacco users would be ordained or could be ordained. It may seem absurd to us now, but the circle was very small 90 years ago. Jack Rogers does a brilliant job of showing how the Bible has been misused to justify oppression. The most glaring example, of course, in the United States is the defense of slavery as consistent with the Christian faith, as if there was no problem between the uh, chattel slavery and the Christian faith. At one point, the church was almost unanimously in favor of the institution of slavery. Somehow, the Holy Spirit led people to understand God's call and to understand the Bible to take us in the direction of liberation. The circle was drawn wider. Only a few generations ago, I could not be standing in this pulpit preaching. Barbara and Linda and Lynn and Mary could not be ruling elders. It took a very, very long time and work by tireless advocates in partnership with the Holy Spirit, but the circle has been drawn wider. Rogers highlights changes in our biblical understanding of one time very controversial issues in the church, like whether Christians can divorce and remarry, especially those who are seeking to be ordained. Over the past 35 years ago or so, the inclusion of gays and lesbians as full members and as ordained elders, deacons, and ministers has stretched uh, our denomination and others, and a push and pull in some ways continues. Now, transgender people face similar struggles in our nation and in the church. The Holy Spirit drawing the circle wider is hard, hard work. It can be exhausting. You may have read that just about 10 days ago at the annual meeting of the Southern Baptist Convention, which is, I think, the largest Protestant uh, denomination, it's uh, referred to as the SBC, Uh, they met for their annual meeting. And they took two actions of note, at least with regard to drawing the circle, in this case, smaller, or at least keeping it from being drawn wider. With a vote of 88% to about 11%, they rejected the appeal by Pastor Rick Warren. You may have heard him of him. Uh, He was asking to reinstate his mega congregation, Saddleback, back into the SBC. The congregation had been ousted because they uh, ordained several women in assistant pastoral roles. Then the SBC made it clear and made it explicit in their constitution that women cannot be pastors at any level. So they rejected the appeal to be included. And then there were a couple other congregations who were boosted, ousted. Uh, And then they made it explicit in the Constitution that women can never serve at any level uh, as pastors. Just as there are distinctions between different Presbyterian streams, there are also distinctions between Baptist streams. In contrast to the PCUSA, this denomination of which we're a part, the Presbyterian Church in America does not ordain women as elders or, or ministers. American Baptists are distinct from Southern Baptists. American Baptists do have a long tradition of women pastors. A woman named Carol E. Holtz Martin is an American Baptist pastor. Uh, But she wrote something that could have very well been talking about the Presbyterian Church USA when she wrote, our denomination was having yet another 
of its wrangles over sexuality. I was tired of it, weary of the luxury of being fully franchised heterosexual, although a woman in ministry, which, uh, which some take issue, with which some take issue. Enough, I said, I'm sick of this. Let's all get on with feeding the poor and taking the good news to the world. I felt clear-eyed and holy as I spoke, she wrote. And she wrote, thanks be to God for wise friends. One of mine turned uh, to look at me. Carol, he said, this is a struggle for the soul of the church. Go home and read Galatians. I did, he was right. The battle cry of Galatians 3.28 is the high point of Paul's letter. Here is the vision that drives Paul along with his frustration at its denial by those he has brought to Christ." End quote. However taxing drawing the circle wider is for each of us and all of us as a group, as a congregation or a denomination, it is a holy calling. I hope as Christians and as Presbyterians, if you identify that way, a big red flag comes up for you when you hear someone appealing to our most base tribal fear of the so-called other in order to scare us often into following him or her, especially if they are claiming to speak for all of Christianity or in some cases seeking to serve in public office. The word scapegoat comes from an ancient Jewish term from Leviticus. You probably know this already, but I'll repeat it just in case. It comes from Leviticus where all the sins of the city would be ritually placed on a goat. That goat would then be taken to the edge of the city and sent into the wilderness so that the sins would be ceremonially removed from the people. In the church, in our nation, we must resist the sinful desire to scapegoat or exclude other people we deem to be different and therefore unworthy. Holtz Martin puts the verse from Galatians into language to, of today this way. In the midst of complex immigration controversies, there is neither native born nor illegal immigrant. In a society dramatically divided by income, there is neither moneyed nor working class nor poor. In the season of elections, there is neither Republican nor Democrat nor independent. And to repeat Paul's own words, there is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ. Draw the circle wide. Amen. May I hear an amen? Amen. amen.